What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well, today is the day that Nintendo officially says goodbye to the old era with the Wii U and the 3DS, which we will go over exactly what time that's happening later on today, as well as some of the discussion around the Wii U's place in Nintendo's history. And then we also have to talk about Microsoft as it appears they're reviving an old program for the Xbox that does make me wonder a bit more about what their plans are for next generation. And then we've also talked about the all digital future rapidly approaching and how regulators and rules don't really seem prepared for any of it. Well, there's a movement happening now that's trying to at least work to bring everyone together to at least have people's voices heard and maybe try to solve this ahead of that. So if you guys enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And of course, members for the channel do get Newswave early and ad free. If you'd like to learn more about that, click the join button down below this video. And we're gonna start today with Microsoft and what appears to be their big showcase that they're lining up for the summer, which they did mention on their Xbox podcast with their business update. We're anticipating it to happen in June, but The Verge does appear to have the exact date for that, which we can see this posted up over on their website, where they say Microsoft is in the middle of planning for its big summer Xbox showcase. I understand this is set to take place on Sunday, June 9th, and Microsoft is currently planning to announce a new Gears of War game at the show. They also go on to talk about Avowed, Indiana Jones, those getting release dates, even Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024, and... We're expecting them to showcase Call of Duty, although most likely Call of Duty will have an official announcement of some kind before that, and this show would be used maybe for like a five or six minute demonstration where they play through a, a chunk of a, of a level like they've done many, many times in the past, but a new Gears of War game, that would be a big deal to have the coalition there as they would be the ones that are like Unreal Engine wizards and I think would give us that quote unquote next gen looking and feeling game, but this should be a big time, or at least a big event for Microsoft with how things are lining up. So uh, looking forward to that, it's June 9th, Sunday, we'll see what they have for us then. Also, we did have a Final Fantasy Tactics mention from Yoshi P at Square Enix, and maybe even alluding to the idea of a, a new game. Well, we can see this posted up in an interview with The Gamer, where he says, we have a lot of our staff who worked on previous games like Final Fantasy Tactics or Final Fantasy 12. So you're gonna have a lot of that tactics feel because a lot of the same people are on the team. He adds that he's very happy to hear another tactics game suggested because the team are fans of the games themselves. We love tactics as well. It's probably about time that we do a new one. You know, I, I do think at this time, while Square Enix apparently is looking to more or less downsize the number of games they're putting out at a time and focus in on each one individually and spend I assume more money on each one and making it like a bigger release. Tactics doesn't necessarily fall under the, uh, the the umbrella of big budget games, but I still think they could do it and have expectations in check for sales because Tactics Ogre apparently sold better than they were expecting. And I do think there is a nice lane for a, a new Final Fantasy Tactics game with kind of that strategy RPG element, of course, because we see Final Fantasy 16 basically be an action game. The Seven Trilogy, the remake trilogy with Rebirth, the most recent release, is kind of in between action and turn-based. And then you just have like a straight up tactics, turn-based strategy uh, RPG for a new Final Fantasy Tactics. I think it'd be really cool. And well, if Square Enix wants to try it, I, I think there is a place for it. Oh, and we do have a new trailer that's upcoming for Star Wars Outlaws. This was posted up over on their official account. Of course, coming from Ubisoft saying, watch the world premiere of the Star Wars Outlaws story trailer. Join us 9 a.m. Pacific, that being tomorrow, Tuesday, April 9th, for a world premiere. And I still think this is gonna be one of their big games that they have set up for their Ubisoft Forward over the summer, but they do wanna at least put out more information for the character, the, the world, of course, that they're building out for it with something like a story trailer. It's still, I need to see a bit more about this game before I'm completely sold on it. I do like the Star Wars universe, so it is interesting to see kind of these, I'd say, side stories to the, the main story that they have running for the different movies. But yeah, Star Wars Outlaws, I, I have my eye on it. I just, I'll see what they have with this trailer. And of course, we'll do some coverage on it when they release it tomorrow. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Nintendo officially saying goodbye to the old era with the Wii U and the 3D Yes, as online play will be completely shut down later on this afternoon, which we can see this posted up over on Nintendo's website. 
where they say at 4 p.m. Pacific on April 8th, 2024, online play and other functionality that uses online communication will end for the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U software. This also includes online cooperative play, internet rankings, and data distribution. Remember last year, the store shut down, so you can't buy anything on the systems. Anyway, it was just online play and it mostly surrounded games like Mario Kart, uh, Splatoon, and of course, Mario Maker, which real quick, we do have an update on that situation. If you remember, there was one level that was left as, okay, this was a tool assisted run to complete it, which if you make a Mario, Mario Maker level, you have to be able to complete it before you can upload and have other people play it. So they had basically a, a computer essentially run through it, right? A tool assisted run. Well, someone managed to beat that level, which you can see this posted up over on Nintendo Life, where they say Super Mario Maker community clears trimming the herbs just days before Wii U online shutdown. They have a tweet here that has the video, which looks absolutely ridiculous, by the way, in motion from, what's that, Sanny X91, uh, Super Mario Maker 2, I guess it says them too. Yeah, that, that looks, I mean, the, the level is, what, 10 or 11 seconds long, but the the precision, the, the button presses at the exact moment going all the way through it is insane to watch in motion. But yeah, there you go. They got the 100%, the they got the good ending. There's no excuses, no nothing, no what ifs, like, yeah, buts, that level technically wasn't cleared. No, it a person played it enough and was able to technically replicate a tool assisted run to make sure all the Super Mario Maker 2 levels were completed just before the thing shuts down later on this afternoon. So that, that is very, very impressive stuff. The, the thing though I, I did notice is there was a lot of discussion online around the Wii U and in kind of its placement in Nintendo history. And there were many people who said that the, kind of were looking at the Wii U and putting it Above the Switch, and that is just very strange to me because I, I kind of look at the Wii U as one of Nintendo's worst systems ever made, and I know they did the Virtual Boy. That's worse, obviously, but the Wii U really, that really hurt. Like, if you look at Nintendo's history, even their sales, I know the GameCube didn't sell like crazy, was like this an incredible seller at retail, but it still did what more than double what the Wii U sold. And I know there was some interesting ideas at play with the Wii U with that gamepad. And I will also go as far as to say that's a system that does feel more like a Nintendo system than the Switch, especially when you look around at the shopping experience with the, the eShop at the time, it had music. I would say the system has just more personality all the way around than the Switch, but it's also a lot slower to get a, to actually navigate and use. So the Switch at least does have functionality technically in place of that personality. But when it really comes down to it with the games, I just, there's no comparison at all. I mean, the Switch has most of the Wii U games, but beyond that, I mean, they just, there's so many titles in the Switch library. To me, it's unmatched in Nintendo's entire history. I mean, there's like everything on the Switch that's represented, all different genres, past games, new games. There's just a lot there to play if you picked up a Switch right now. Whereas I can't necessarily go to the Wii U's library and just start pointing out as many games to pick up right away. But I will say this, the Wii U is probably poised to be a pretty rare system if you have it 100% complete with the tablet and the games are already going up in price. So if nothing else, now might be a good time to start up that Wii U collection and at the very least, modify the system because the homebrew community has done some very impressive things with it. And I mean, you can't play online with it stock. You can't really buy any games digitally for it stock. So why not modify that and your 3DS? Because at this time, Nintendo considers it completely legacy and there's a whole world of stuff to explore out there in that homebrew market. But still end of an era. And hopefully this also signifies Nintendo adopting a much more easy to use and I'll say reliable account system to where you're not going from something like the Wii to the Wii U and it's a, it's a whole situation just getting your information from one system to the other. I expect it to be a very clean transition from the current system to the next system with Nintendo, hopefully having their account system set up with that specifically in mind, you sign in or sign out of one, sign into the other, all your saved data is there, all your digital purchases are there and you can re-download and, and play whatever's compatible. So uh, yeah, uh, end of an era though for the Wii U and the 3DS, definitely a moment of time that uh, on one end was really cool with the 3DS and on the other, 
uh, really hurt, I'd say, Nintendo with the Wii U. Next up, let's talk about an old program at Microsoft with Xbox that appears to be getting revived or spun back up, reformed even, and that is their backwards compatibility program, as they say, for preservation. And uh, it's a funny one at times here from Microsoft, but either way, we'll take a look. This posted up over on Windows Central, did have the exclusive, as a lot of this information seemed to come from emails from Sarah Bond that they had attained, and then Microsoft just confirmed everything anyway. So this seems to be completely confirmed and legitimate, but this we can see from Windows Central, where they say as part of the emails to her team, Sarah Bond revealed that Microsoft has now set up a dedicated team to ensure the future proofing of the current Xbox game library against future hardware paradigm shifts, ensuring that our games remain accessible long into the future. Saying, quote, we have formed a new team dedicated to game preservation, important to all of us at Xbox and the industry itself. We are building on our strong history of delivering backwards compatibility to our players, and we remain committed to bringing forward the amazing library of Xbox games for future generations of players to enjoy. Now, the obvious thing here, if you're bringing that team back together, and then you look at the Activision Blizzard, the entire, like, the entire back catalog of games that they now would be able to look at and go, okay, can we then bring these up to the Xbox series? Can we bring these up to our next generation system? And that's why you'd bring the team together now to start working on it for that launch that we believe is at the end of 2026. So that's, that's actually not that far off if you really think about it, what, two, two and a half years from now? So in that case, this team coming back together I do start, I, I do expect to start hearing more and more about older Call of Duty games coming to Game Pass, but then also some games that were kind of left behind in Activision Blizzard's back catalog, like those Transformer games. I, I think that'd be really cool to have those come back and do like a online play and you just play it right on your Xbox series and maybe frame rate boost and HDR. And then you can kind of go down the list and start thinking of other titles that they can bring up from there. But this team coming together now, I think is something that's more planned for even the future with their next generation device. And that could be, hey, everything is just compatible. Like everything we have on the Xbox series now, the Xbox One, the <laughs> just about the 360 licensing, obviously in tow, but everything just kind of goes up to the next generation system. No questions asked there day one. And that is going to be a lot of work. It was a lot of work to do what they've done here with the uh, with the Xbox, uh, the Xbox One to like the Xbox Series, and seems like it's going to be a lot of work going to what might end up being a cloud-based or at least cloud-reliant, along with AI, as that was another aspect that Sarah Bond talked quite a bit about with these different emails. Oh, and Microsoft talking about game preservation is pretty funny. A lot of people were pointing out that Hellblade 2 doesn't even have a physical release. And here's kind of where I think Microsoft is right now with the game preservation. I think they're more or less talking about digital preservation. As weird as that sounds, right? But technically if you buy or a game comes to backwards compatibility and you owned it way back in the day on the 360 and it's like a something that's just in your digital uh, digital library, like your purchases, it would then just become available on the next generation system. We've had that happen before with different titles that went on sale again later on. So I think that's more or less what they're talking about here. The, the entitlements that are attached to your account, those will stay attached well into the future if maybe EA or uh, Take-Two or whoever revives an older game. There you go, it's just in your library and you can download it or who knows, maybe cloud stream it and that's what they're they're looking towards but interesting stuff here certainly something to keep an eye on with microsoft and see how serious they're willing to get with backwards compatibility in that activision blizzard lineup next up let's stick with microsoft with their upcoming playstation 5 release that being sea of thieves at the end of this month as it appears based on some reports that might be one of the big tests that microsoft is keeping an eye on to see if it's worth bringing over other games in the future. This we can see posted up. This is over on uh, The Verge saying, sources familiar with Microsoft's plans tell me that the company continues to evaluate other Xbox exclusive games coming to PS5. I understand see if these will be a key test for whether other games might make their way to PS5 or Nintendo Switch. And I, I think looking at this, the reason Sea of Thieves is one of the big tests is, as it's, I know this always sounds weird when I tell people this, and I'm sure some of you who play Sea of Thieves understand, but this is one of Microsoft's most popular games, the Sea of Thieves on PC and on Xbox. So going to PlayStation 5, where it's a very unique title on top of that, there's 
Nothing really like it on the PlayStation 5. You would expect that game to do fairly well. And Microsoft, of course, keeping an eye on to see how the PlayStation base maybe reacts to an online live service title like that, especially when it comes to signing up for Xbox Live. Okay, what kind of boost does that give us? Because you do have to sign in with an Xbox Live account. So their big metric being monthly active users, okay, how does this affect our monthly active users after the release, six months after the release, a year after? I do think Sea of Thieves is one that they're gonna keep an eye on to maybe give them reason to bring over other big live service games. I keep seeing Halo come up. I don't know if Halo would necessarily be one that would make the jump immediately if Sea of Thieves started just doing really, really well and was exploding up the charts and they're making a ton of money and active users are pouring through the door, but I can never rule out any of Microsoft's catalog currently because they obviously see what's going on in the market. And it's not even just Xbox, just in general, where the console sales, console again being the box that you just put under your TV and that's it. It's not like a hybrid model or something like that, like the Switch. It's kind of stagnant now and they have to keep growing to find more people. So this is just one of Microsoft's the pieces of their strategy and that's putting games on other platforms. And I think Sony's gonna be doing something similar. Not necessarily we're putting stuff on Xbox, but looking outside of it on places like PC, for example. So it's it's something to keep an eye on with Microsoft, but Sea of Thieves has already gotten off to a really, really good start in terms of pre-orders. And I do think it'll do pretty well on Sony's uh, PlayStation 5 platform when it comes to the like the popular live service titles. I think it's gonna be up there. So we'll see how Microsoft responds, especially with some of their upcoming titles that maybe make the jump a year or two down the line. And in our last bit of news, we're gonna talk about, a, I think an interesting campaign that is started up now is going on to try to bring people together so you can have your voices heard around concerns for this all digital future. And I do wanna point out a comment that sort of pointed me in the direction of this. We can see this is posted up. This is the this is the the comment of the day essentially. Crazy Charlie says, "Dear John, please cover the Stop Killing Games movement started by Ross Scott from Accursed Farms. This is the first legal effort worldwide in preventing video game companies doing what Ubisoft did to the OG to the OG the crew. Totally worth it for the sake of preserving video games." So, this I I think this is a really good idea in general as Essentially what it does, if you look at their website here, it's very basic. Stop killing games, right? This site is dedicated to real world action on ending the practice of publishers destroying video games they have sold to customers. You can click the take action button below. And essentially what happens is it does 95% of the legwork for you for, okay, who do I contact? What do I say? How do I write in? That sort of thing, right? So you click some buttons and it, you do still have to fill out forms, right? But it at least just kind of leads you by the hand through that process. So you can have your voice heard for, as they show here, government petitioning, official government petitions have been introduced to prohibit the practice of intentionally rendering commercial video games inoperable when support ends. So think of the crew. That it's like a great example that they're using here, which I, I think makes a lot of sense, where you bought the crew, but because it's so reliant on online servers, instead of maybe pushing a patch or doing something that's complete offline, they just shut the game down. Like that's it. It's just it just doesn't work anymore. Even though you bought it from them, and you could have bought it at release for full price, could have bought it down the road on sale, doesn't matter. You handed them money for it. And that's uh Seems off, right? Like, but here's the problem going into that all digital future. We're going to it very, very fast and we have not had the chance to have rules, regulations, laws catch up. And it doesn't seem like there's a big push for them to catch up right now. And I think this is just at least a good start as they are, again, doing a lot of the work for you on this website. So it is linked down below in the sources. If you wanna go over there, check it out. They have it broken up by region. Once you click that button, you know, go by, okay, where am I in the world kind of thing. And then they sort of point you in the right direction. Definitely, I think worth doing. Again, heading towards that all digital future, the customer gets less and less power, the platform holder, the publisher, basically have all of it. So here's hoping we get something done before we inevitably get to that point, which I still think is uh, right around the corner. And before we go to the members comment, we'll take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday. We're asked, have you ever owned a Wii U? Well, yeah, 44% say yes, I still have one. That's actually pretty good. 13% say yes, but I don't have it anymore. Plenty probably got traded in when the Switch came out. Then 43% say no, I never owned a Wii U. Okay, so total 56% of people 
don't have their Wii U anymore or had never owned it. And there were many people that I, I've talked to who are Nintendo fans, but they didn't buy the Wii U because uh, the marketing was, I mean, the marketing did not help that system at all. It was very, very bad in terms of showing what exactly the idea of the system was at the time. Is it a tablet? Is it a console as well? People were just not sure in general, right? And those are even people who are really in tune with the stuff and in touch with it and the mainstream is just completely lost on this thing. Um, and then people look at it as, okay, well, that was the precursor to the Switch. I actually think that was just Nintendo with their DS trying to bring that to the living room because it, it sold so well with the Wii. It's like, well, yeah, let's do the two screen approach in the living room. Did not work at all. So the, the whole thing was strange. You can use a, a, you know, the pro controller at times. You can't, you need the tablet here. You don't need it there. And it, is, it was Nintendo all over the place. And now they have their Switch and the messaging is clear cut. It's very convenient. It fits into a lot of people's lives. And I think that's the biggest change from the Wii U to the Switch and why they're seeing so much success now. And then we'll finish up with the members comment. We can see this posted up. This is from Bruce who says that 40 FPS mode for 120 Hertz TVs on PlayStation games is the sweet spot for me. I still get those good visuals and that 30 to 40 FPS jump seems like a good trade. It, it is odd, like the 10 FPS difference there does make it legitimately feel smoother. And I know it's people talk about, oh, it divides, it still divides evenly, right? Like 40 into 120, that kind of thing. Um, but the problem I think we run into and why you don't see more of that used outside of like, like Sony seems to do it quite a bit. Sony does manufacture TVs. They like to push their newer TVs alongside of their hardware Blu-ray players, uh, the PS5. And typically they have 120 Hertz modes, but there are many people who just, they just don't use any of that stuff with their TV. There are many, you have to remind them to turn game mode on and because it's just obviously they're trying to use it with like, like cinema mode and the lag is super high and it's not a great experience there necessarily compared to game mode. So because there aren't many people, I'm sure, utilizing all those features, they're probably publishers who are like, look, we have the data that shows that it's just not used much, so we're not gonna bother with it. But I would like to see us get to a position where 120 hertz TVs are just, constant, like almost standard. And then we start seeing that 40 FPS mode used more often for the PS5, who knows, maybe the, even the PS5 Pro or even the next generation systems, especially if they really want those 8K visuals. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. It was Nintendo saying goodbye to the old era with the Wii U and the 3DS. Let me know your memories about those systems as well as if you're still playing them online today before the shutdown. And then also what about Microsoft spinning back up their backwards compatibility program. What games would you like to see come back for the new generation from the Activision Blizzard catalog. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.